So in this uh, video, we're going to review the key elements of uh, the previous set of videos uh, where we talk about the path to durable complete remission. Uh, I'll try and pull everything together um, for you in one place. Um, if you want to see the individual aspects of this, uh, you'll look at some of our previous videos. Uh, but I'm going to talk about the path to durable complete remission in prostate cancer and why I think it's an important thing to discuss at this juncture. So what, I, what do I mean by complete remission and why am I talking about it and not cure? Uh, in one of our previous videos I've discussed why I think the concept of cure is uh, not only useless uh, but will lead to wrong decisions about treatment. And instead, we're going to talk about durable, complete remission. Why have I taken this stance? Well, cancers in general can recur many years after apparent curative treatment. For example, after radical prostatectomy, prostate cancer has recurred up to 25 years after the surgery. A patient can have an undetectable PSA for 20 years, and then the cancer can come back. Um, after a mastectomy, breast cancer has returned after 30 years. Uh, so you only can say you're free of disease, which is what I mean by cure, when you die of something else. Until that point, you can't know that the cancer might not come back. And so you're in remission. What's the cancer during, doing during those invisible years? Uh, this is what's called cancer dormancy. That is, the cancer is seated elsewhere in your body, but is silent quiescent. It survives but does not grow. This is an established enough concept that Wikipedia has a very nice introduction to the basic ideas of cancer dormancy. We'll not talk about cancer dormancy today in much detail. We'll talk about getting a complete remission and later we'll talk about maintaining dormancy. So why am I taking this tact uh, and how, what are, how do we get complete remissions? Yeah, well, in this I have to go back to the past 50 years of cancer treatment and what have we learned uh, about managing this cancer treatment in general. Uh, and so this is not prostate specific. Across all significant cancers, uh, partial remissions only have a minor impact on survival, usually months, at the outside a year. Complete remissions are required to get long-term disease-free survival. And complete remissions in most cancers of adult life require well-designed combinations. It would be rare in any cancer to get a durable complete remission with a single drug. Almost always it requires combinations. Also, complete remissions are best if they're rapidly obtained, usually within three to six months. Otherwise, resistance has time to develop. And this is across all cancer types, and I think each of these points apply to prostate cancer. Durable complete remission, what am I talking about? A complete remission is all evidence that the cancer is gone with the best imaging techniques available. Second, the PSA is undetectable. Uh, if your cancer is making other markers like bone-specific alkaline and phosphatase, that should normalize. If you have a neuroendocrine prostate, then the markers for that need to disappear. Durable years have to pass without the cancer returning. Now, there are two kinds of durable complete remissions. One is maintained, and the other is unmaintained. A maintained remission is you will remain on some kind of treatment. Unmaintained remissions uh, are the treatment stops and you don't have to be on any treatment at all, and the cancer doesn't come back. Unmaintained remissions in prostate cancer are rare. So for the most part, with prostate cancer, we're talking about inducing a remission and how best to maintain it. Now, with this, I'm talking about metastatic prostate cancer. I'm not talking about men undergoing radical prostatectomy or radiation for cancer confined to their gland. I'm talking about metastatic disease. So how do we do, induce complete remissions? Well, what are the characteristics of successful combination uh, therapy? This falls right out of probability theory. 
if you had three agents, each with a one in a hundred chance of failure, then if you do single sequential agents, each agent would have a one in a hundred chance of failure. If you combine two drugs, the risk of the combined combination failing is one over a hundred times one over a hundred, or one in ten thousand. If you have three drugs, it becomes one in a million. So suddenly, by doing combinations that have three or four drugs, you dramatically reduce the risk of resistance emerging during treatment. Second, successful combinations are such that the toxicities of the drugs don't overlap. If every drug in the combination uh, causes you to become anemic, that's not a good idea. If they all cause you to get peripheral neuropathy or kidney failure, you don't want to do that. So the toxicity should be different. Drug interactions need to be avoided. You, I like to think of this as the plaid, plaid versus stripes. Plaids are nice and stripes are nice, but you don't put them together. And some drugs individually are very good, but combine very badly together and cause severe side effects. These principles apply wherever resistance to treatment is a problem. Not only are most cancers complete remissions induced by combinations, but it's also true for AIDS and tuberculosis. The real breakthrough for AIDS was combining three and four drug combinations. And tuberculosis is the same problem. We use three and four drug combinations for tuberculosis for the very same reason. So this isn't even cancer specific. There are several forms of durable complete remission. Uh, when you get the remission with a drug combination, then you stop and no other treatment is needed. This is true for cancer of the testes and Hodgkin's disease. In other patients, you need short, very intense treatment uh, to remission, and then mild treatment for several years to consolidate that remission. And this is acute, uh, characteristic for acute lymphoblastic leukemia in children. This was the breakthrough St. Jude's is so famous for. Uh, another approach is intense treatment to get a remission, and then continuous low in intensity treatment. Uh, for maintenance. Uh, finally, continuous treatment as long as it works. You've got a remission, but you just continue on. And this has been the practice for prostate cancer. There are patients who go into complete remission with metastatic disease on hormonal therapy, and the practice has been to leave the patients on hormonal therapy continuously. What are the reasonable goals for prostate cancer? I think currently it's it's a reasonable goal to develop combinations that reliably induce complete remission in metastatic prostate cancer. I think it's also reasonable to think we can develop combinations that keep the cancer dormant after the patient enters remission and that the patient should be able to have a normal testosterone and the cancer remain dormant. I think these are reasonable goals. So. How do we apply these general rules to prostate cancer? What's unique about this disease? Well, one unique aspect of prostate cancer is its dependence on testosterone and the testosterone receptor. It's called the androgen receptor. And it's rare for prostate cancer to become independent of the androgen receptor. With Keras, uh, we've looked at 388 men with advanced disease, and only three lack the androgen receptor. So prostate cancer is like a crack addict as far as the androgen receptor is concerned. And as an addict, it gets very creative in getting the fix. So the first step to durable complete remission is to get optimum androgen blockade. That's the foundation for successful complete remission in prostate cancer. Uh, we're very lucky that we have a, a group of very bright young people working in this disease and some spectacular new drugs for hormonal therapy that allow us to do things we didn't we're not capable of doing just a few years ago. And it looks like this pace of innovation is continuing. Uh, and it's one of the reasons I have optimism. So let's talk about some of the new agents uh, and why I'm excited about it. As I mentioned, complete remissions from a single agent in the cancer of adult life uh, are not common. Uh, and we're already seeing this in prostate cancer. And for me, one key trial is the PREVAIL trial. And these patients all had failed Lupron, uh, or one of the related drugs, called LHRH agonists. And most of them had also, close to 90% had also failed Casidex. 
So most of the patients had failed Lupron and Casidex, uh, and they were randomized to placebo versus Xtandi. Just under 20% went into complete remission. I can't tell you how unique this is. A essentially third-line pill that induces complete remission in a cancer of adult life is very unusual. This is just an extraordinary finding. So how does prostate cancer satisfy its, its addiction to testosterone receptor activation? Well, it can make more testosterone receptor like having a big sail in a light wind, and that can be blocked by extending. IRN509 is a competing drug coming along uh, that may or may not uh, be better uh, or equal to extending. Another common trick of the cancer is to import cholesterol bound to the LDL particle and to use that cholesterol to make its own testosterone. So the cancer functions like a miniature testicle and can make its own testosterone uh, in the face of uh, Lupron or other drugs that even in the face of ca surgical castration. And Zytiga has been developed specifically to block that pathway. A third mechanism is to activate the testosterone receptor without testosterone. And basically what the body can do is add phosphate to the receptor and that makes the receptor able to activate the growth and spread of cancer without testosterone being present. There are candidate drugs to block that, but nothing's been established. Finally, and this is some exciting work, uh, is the cancer can cut the androgen receptor into a piece that will activate uh, growth and spread without any, uh, any androgen. And uh, at this point, we only have agents in the laboratory that block that process. This latter process takes time, and so my hope is that by inducing remissions fast enough, the cancer won't have time to activate this androgen receptor fragment, uh, but that remains to be proven. So let's talk about cholesterol control and maintenance of resistance. We've just said prostate cancer can import LDL cholesterol and make its own testosterone. So where does the cancer get its cholesterol? Well. Prostate cancer have, cells have on their surface a receptor, a protein that binds to the LDL cholesterol in your blood and sucks the LDL particle into the cell. The fat in that LDL particle can be used for the energy metabolism, but the cholesterol can be used to make uh, testosterone. So the higher your LDL cholesterol, the better the cancer is able to make its own testosterone. Very interesting, Gleason 9s and 10s have been shown to be able to make their own cholesterol. They don't even need circulating cholesterol. They can make their own cholesterol from scratch. Fortunately, the statins block that too. And Crestor is the most active statin for that purpose. So we have uh, in our hands, between Zytega uh, and statins and other tools, ways of lowering the LDL cholesterol and blocking the cholesterol conversion to testosterone. Uh, one thing that really fascinates me is one recent study showed that adding cholesterol to cancer cells can turn on the machinery uh, needed to make testosterone. There doesn't even need to be gene, a gene mutation. It's just sufficient there be enough cholesterol on hand. So this is just something that cancer cells automatically switch to when they need to. Taxotere, uh, outside of hormonal therapy, Taxotere is an old drug, been around since the 1980s, standard chemotherapy for prostate cancer, usually used at the end of, end of disease, uh, and there it's not all that impressive. Um, Taxotere has undergone a dramatic rehabilitation, uh, a clinical trial that is really a breakthrough, uh, and I think I'm expressing a consensus statement among investigators in prostate cancer. I think we all regard the charted trial as a huge uh, event. And in this trial, they compared Lupron alone versus Lupron plus Taxotere in patients with bulky metastatic prostate cancer. 
And there was a dramatic benefit of adding Taxotere to Lupron in high volume metastatic prostate cancer. Of course, I'm very interested in complete remissions. And so uh, Phil Kantoff shared this with me, <clears throat> pointed out this observation. If you look down at the circulated figures, uh, these are patients that ended a PSA uh, complete remission. Uh, and in hormonal therapy alone, Lupron alone, 14% had an undetectable PSA at six months versus close to 30% of the patients where Taxotere is added. So Taxotere, adding Taxotere to Lupron in these patients dramatically improve, increased the likelihood of a PSA remission. And this persisted. At 12 months, there was still nearly double the number of patients in complete remission when Taxotere is added. So it's very clear if you present with bulky advanced disease, adding Taxotere to Lupron uh, dramatically improves the frequency of uh, complete remission. Um, so that's an interesting thing. Well, we, we already just discussed how Lupron is really half-assed hormonal therapy, and the cancer cells have any number of means of getting around Lupron alone. So for me, the real take home for this is what happens if you had an optimum combination of hormonal therapy agents and added taxotere. Uh, my gut tells me the proportion of patients in complete remission are going to skyrocket. The next step, of course, is that we now know that prostate cancer is not, they're not all alike. That prostate cancer varies from patient to patient in often dramatic ways. And I think a, a key step to getting durable complete remission is for us to understand what each individual patient's cancer was doing. This was not a new concept. Uh, this concept has been tested in lung cancer, breast cancer, ovarian, in those diseases. You don't deal with lung cancer alone or breast cancer. So this is a summary of what's happened to lung cancer in 2003. Lung cancer with adenocarcinoma was one thing, black box, like prostate cancer is today. Now in 2012, lung cancers are separated into many different subtypes based on the specific genetic change and drug treatment programs have been developed for each of these mutations. That's what we need to do with prostate cancer. Again, in this insight, I, I think I'm speaking on a consensus level. There are major efforts going forward to identify these key elements of prostate cancer. Uh, one program that particularly impresses me is the uh, Dream Teams uh, by the Prostate Cancer Foundation. Uh, Phil Kantoff at, in, in Boston has the East Coast team, and Eric Small in UCSF is leading the West Coast team. And these, pa these teams are biopsying metastatic prostate cancer in a step-by-step -step fashion, identifying the genetic changes that occur in the cancer that determine response. And that is just the process that we need. So I'm very excited uh, that what needs to be done is being done. So to review, the strategic principles guiding treatment in prostate cancer are that complete remissions matter, and that intelligent drug combinations rather than single drug usage is the path to success. We'll get nowhere with single drugs used sequentially. The drug combinations present unique side effects, and so success will depend on our paying attention to the side effects of combinations and think intelligently about how to minimize this. Again, I need to remind you that prostate cancer happens in an age group where heart disease, hypertension, and diabetes are a problem, and that the cancer treatments can make these worse. So it's not a simple matter of combining drugs intelligently and managing side effects. Unfortunately for prostate cancer, uh, we won't all see durable complete remissions unless we keep the patients from dying of heart disease, hypertension, or diabetes.